Yeah, I know. I like to be asked before somebody does something, you know, even if you're totally agreeable to it, it's just nice to know that somebody respects you enough to ask before they do something. It is true. I just always assume the camera is rolling. <laughs> you know, and that's probably a good attitude to have. I being on the other end of it, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, whoever comes on is 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 fine with it. I had a lady uh, a couple of years ago, actually, who came on and it was just a Zoom call. I did not have the recording on at all. And she refused to use the camera because she didn't want me to record. I said, I promise you, I'm not going to record yeah. you. Like you can see the recording button at the top. Like you'll know if I'm recording you. Right, right. And she didn't believe it. She hung up. Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, I and, won't be hanging up on you today. Well, she's the only one that's ever done that, which well, is really good. bizarre. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and after, you know, so... But even then, I didn't record anybody without asking permission. So uh, we'll wait for Matt to log in so I can get my audio fixed. But the way this is going to run um, is I'm going to introduce myself briefly. Then I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to read the introduction that you've provided for me. And then um, you've got your talking points that um, were given to me. And I've created a few questions from those talking points. We have a full hour, <clears throat> so I want you to feel really comfortable talking as long as you want to really elaborate on things. People really like examples. I, I know I do. So the more examples you can provide, um, I think the easier it will be for someone to understand what you're trying to uh, relay to them. Perfect. That makes sense. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and feel free to talk about your background. So what I'll do when we first start off, I'll do the introduction. And then I'll ask you to talk a little bit about you. And I want you to feel comfortable talking about whatever um, you want to talk about. Some people stick strictly to their portfolio, their work portfolio, work portfolio. <laughs> Other people uh, might talk a little bit about their families. Yeah. Um, you know, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I like doing the Zoom call because even though it's an international radio show, I think it feels a little bit more like a private conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I, I do some just on the phone and it's just not the same. No, it's not. Um, it really isn't. Um, and then once we get to the point where we're going to take a break, Matt, my producer, will tell you via the uh, chat, four, three, two, one, and then 30 seconds. Great. Right about the two minute mark is when I'll probably ask you if there's anything um, that you like to promote, or if you'd like to share your social media, um, where somebody can get your book. Um, so right around the two, three minute mark, we'll do that. And then I'll probably have about a minute to talk about, um, how people can get in touch with me and then we'll take the break. We'll come back. I'll reintroduce you very briefly and we'll start our conversation again. Wonderful. Is if there is something that I bring up, um, if, a, if I ask you a question that you're just like, okay, that's not where I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> just say, hey, you know what? That's a great question. Let's leave that for another show. Or let's okay. let's talk about that another time. I'm fine with that. I don't ever want to put you in a position where you're uncomfortable. So that's your out. <laughs> so you can get out of that question very easily. Um, if there, there is a couple of questions that I've written down in here. So I just want to go over them real briefly with you sure. so that you can start thinking about them. And um, so we'll, we'll start off with once we introduce you and you talk about yourself, what I want you to define what detox or what toxicity is. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll define that. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, what does a toxic relationship look like? Um, how can you, you know, identify one? And, and most of my questions will just kind of go along as we're having the conversation, but this is just kind of a direction that we'll take. Um, why is it important to focus on ourselves? Um, I might ask you, um, what are some beliefs that people might need to change to be more successful? Okay. Um, how do we shift our inner beliefs? Uh, what is the best advice you have ever received? 
And the last question I typically ask is what advice would you give your 20 year old self? Mm, okay, great. So do you have any questions for me before we get started? No, I'm always, I'm, I'm easy. I'm an open book and I love just to be in the conversation and let it flow. So I'm good. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully you feel really comfortable and, and let's just have a conversation and, and let's talk about, and we will talk about your books. Um, so we'll start off with the relationships and then, and then we'll lean into your books. Um, the second half of the show, I'd like to spend the majority of that on just, just your books. Um, you know, talking about what inspired you to write the books, um, you know, just give people the why people love to know why, like, absolutely. Why did you write that book? Why, why didn't you write a book on accounting? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Why, why is that book so important to you? So that all make sense. Absolutely. I'm ready. All right. Me too. So after this month, I'm actually going to be, um, you, this particular audio video will go on our YouTube channel, but I will no longer be with um, Voice America. Oh, wow. I'm actually um, leaving Voice America and I'm going to be doing just a podcast. Um, and, and it was a decision that I made because my uh, numbers are actually much higher for my podcast than they are for my radio show. Oh, wow. And so I actually, because I'm international, almost everyone listens on podcast. And I thought, well, there's really no need for me to do a live radio show if most of the people who listen to my show listen via a podcast. Right, right. So, um, yeah, so we were kind of shifting gears. We're going to just do a podcast. Um, I think I have a new platform um, that I'll be using. I've got to do a test run this next week or so, um, but it should be a lot of fun. So just so you know, um, there's some changes happening, but yours, yours will go live today. It will be on the um, replay, but if you want to send people to the um, uh, YouTube channel, they can listen to the whole thing. Okay, wonderful. I will send many people there. I look forward to it. Um, where do you live? Uh, I live in LA, uh, specifically Marina Del Rey. Oh, okay. By the water. How about yeah, you? very nice. Yeah, my uh, my daughter lives in San Diego right now. She she is doing her um, residency at Scripps. Oh wow. Yeah, wow, she's it's so funny. I'm in San Diego today. I'm going to an event after this, and I literally just drove by Scripps. I just saw it. Oh, how funny. Yeah, last yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, she was in L.A. She went to medical school up in Pomona, and then she lived in L.A., and then now she's um, she just moved there to start her residency program this month, so. Perfect. Yeah, it's yeah, she, She's right on the water. Nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, she called me. She goes, Mom, I found an apartment right on the beach. What do you think? I'm like, if you can afford it, go for it. Why not? Absolutely. Where do you live? I am actually in uh, Virginia. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not on the beach. I'm about a mile and a half. Oh, nice. That's beaches. great. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I wanted to be a little bit inland just because of all the weather that we have out here. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's very, yes, indeed. Our yes. weather here, our, our, our concern, of course, earthquakes that can happen anywhere. So, you know. We're Why, not absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that is definitely a concern. And I did live in LA many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I actually um, was there when that big earthquake hit. Mm. And I was married at the time. And that all our stuff was still in boxes. Oh, wow. And so middle of the night, I, I thought my husband was pushing me off the bed. I thought like he was having a bad dream or something. And, and I put my arm like this. I'm like, and I said, stop pushing me. And the next thing I know is the mattress flips and we're both on the floor. Oh, wow. Wow. That's the Northridge quake, right? I'm guessing. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was just, it was unbelievable. Wow. The, our apartment, he was in medical school at the time in our apartment, the, um, the wall cracked and it was, wow. it was quite the event, but, um, yeah, I think our dog slept through the whole thing. 
Really? That, wow, that's yeah. amazing. She was just, I, I look up and I walk into the living room. I look up and there she is just sitting on the, on the cushion on the couch, like nothing happened. Wow. That's amazing. I don't know why you're all freaking out. I'm just, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> so yeah, but um, it, it was, uh, it was an eventful day that day. It's quite the welcome to LA <clears throat> or, yeah. or California, I should say, but yeah. Very how long did you, how long after that did you stay? I didn't stay very long. I stayed a year and then I got a job um, in Phoenix. So he stayed, he finished medical school. I moved to um, to Phoenix. And then as soon as he was done with all his classes, he moved in with me in Phoenix. So nice. And here's Matt. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Do you like to call TJ? TJ, yes. Okay. Hey, good morning, Fuzzy. How you doing? Good. I would like you to meet TJ. TJ, this is my awesome producer, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey, TJ. How you doing today? Great. Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. All hey, right. Matt, uh, I'm, yeah. awesome. I'm having issues with my with my uh, audio. It's not connecting. Um. Okay. Uh, the Yeti. It's a Yeti. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I did notice that it's sounding a little bit of a uh, little roomier here. Um, so yeah, if it's not connected, I'm not sure. Um, maybe try unplugging it and plugging it back in, and we can go into the settings again. Yeah. Try it one more time. Try it one more time. Maybe. maybe try a different USB port if it's possible. Yeah, I don't have another one. I just have the one. Okay. It just says MacBook Air. Um, it doesn't even have the Yeti on the list of. In the settings, okay. Not mm. anywhere on there, yeah. All right. Well, you don't sound too bad. Um, you're coming through pretty uh, clearly. So, um, do we it off? Yeah, you can go ahead and leave it off there. Uh, just go ahead and give me a count back from five, Fozzie. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and uh, TJ, go ahead and do the same for me. Just come back from five. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, perfect. Yep, you hear you clearly, and we are good on the levels, so that, um, that's good. Um, let me send a hello on the chat, Fozzy. Make sure that's working. Got it. All right, excellent. Um, we're good to go. We'll get started in uh, just about a minute. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. And it, it's the full hour. I have a I have a Zoom at on the top of the hour, so we should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll we'll probably end a couple minutes early, Perfect. and then I'll follow up with an email afterwards, sending you the link and everything. Right. Um, all the information. Probably it'll probably take me a couple of days. So by Friday, you should get that all that Wonderful. information. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the to the conversation. This will be fun. Yeah. Someone without the external microphone, this will be interesting. <laughs> we'll see, right? We will. I mean, you it know? sounds good for me. I don't know. Good. Yeah. That's, you know what? That's, that's good. All right, 10 seconds. All right. Thank you. Yep. Have a great show. <laughs> thank you. It's staff and management. <laughs> Welcome to Focus on Success with Fazia Costi. Our program is designed to help you with executive function challenges. Our guest experts offer perspective, experience, and ideas to improve different aspects of your life. Now, here is your host, Fazia Costi. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have a wonderful guest lined up for you, TJ Woodward. Uh, TJ is a revolutionary recovery expert, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, educator, and addiction treatment specialist who's helped countless of people through his simple yet powerful teachings. He is the creator of the Conscious Recovery Method, which is a groundbreaking and effective approach to viewing and treating addiction. TJ is also the author of three 
best-selling books and their respective workbooks, The Conscious Recovery, Conscious Being, and Conscious Creation. So welcome to the show, TJ. Thank you, Fozzie. I'm delighted to be here. I look forward to our conversation. Well, I'm really excited that you're you're here as well. Uh, I, I think addiction is a really big issue these days. So I think your insight will be very helpful to many people. But let's talk a little bit um, about you first. Tell us about you. What what has brought you to where you're at today? Well, you know, my my path throughout life has gone through many different twists and turns, but ultimately my own story has led me to this purpose, this mission of helping people not only break the cycle of their addiction, but also live a life deeply on purpose. And, you know, my own story, I remember being, I, I like to go back and talk about it from the very beginning, because it really okay. does inform my point of view. And I remember being a very, very happy child, open, receptive, loving, connected. There's the words could go on and on. And I remember a sensation or a time, a moment when that stopped being the truth for me. And it was as if someone or something came in and put a wall around my heart. And I remember this one moment where I actually did shut down and I decided some huge things about myself. And we're talking about seven years old here. I decided, oh, wow, yeah, right. Big decisions. I wasn't good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not lovable. And these decisions stayed with me throughout my uh, childhood, my teen years, and into my early 20s. Um, ultimately, there was addiction involved. You know, I got sober. But it, the quest or the journey began when I turned from trying to manipulate the world and realize that what really needed to change is something within me. And it really was about returning to that place of that joy, that happiness, and that connection that was always there. I had just lost touch with it. Wow. Okay. You know, I, I love something that you said in, in, in all of that. You said you want to live on purpose. What does that mean? Explain to me what, what that means for you. Well, I think for me, purpose is such an important part of my journey. And for many years, I thought it was an external, like if I could just get the perfect job, I would feel like I had a purpose. If I could get the perfect partner, I would feel like I have a purpose. But ultimately, I've come to discover that purpose is really something that happens from the inside out. And it really did come out of my own journey. I remember one, at one point I was facilitating um, a workshop and this process organically came up where we talked about one of the most profound and positive life changing moments that happened in our lives. Everyone wrote that down and was sharing with a partner. And then I realized in that moment that it's possible that our true purpose is to help bring that into the world. In other words, to share that gift that we were given, whatever that moment was. And of course, that looked different for everyone in the room. You know, I find that fascinating. In fact, I work with, uh, as an executive function coach, I work with clients who have a lot of challenges. And that is something similar to what I tell most people. Mm -hmm. I always tell, you know, your challenges today will be your strengths tomorrow. You just have to figure out that path and, and how you're going to get to the other side. Yeah. And once and we the, have discovered a way to get to the other side, then it's about how do we share that with the world? Yeah. No, I love that. I, I absolutely love that. But let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, detoxing yourself. I mean, today we're going to talk about saying goodbye to toxic relationships and detoxing yourself. So let's talk a little bit about what does toxicity mean? Let's define that. What is your definition of toxicity? Yeah, well, it's so popular in our culture right now. You can't go to any social media without seeing something written or hearing someone talking about removing toxicity, right? Getting rid of toxic work environments, getting rid of toxic relationships. And one thing that I've noticed is it's very external. This person is toxic and I need to step away. So when we think about what toxicity is, I think about, you know, toxicity in the environment. It's poison, right? It's very simply poison, something... Right. We think about a toxic, you know, a toxic dump, right? That's a, where there's toxic chemicals that will harm us. So in its most simplistic uh, definition, it would be something that causes harm to ourselves, right? So again, we tend to think of that as something outside of ourselves. But I think what we're really talking about today is to look at what 
what needs to be healed within us so that we're not continuing to choose these relationships. So let's talk specifically, give me some examples of relationships that maybe have some toxic elements. What would that look like? Well, I mean, it could be uh, being in a relationship with someone who doesn't see us, doesn't share our same purpose or passion, or not, not that they need to share that same purpose or passion for themselves, but to honor it, to see it, to, to right. hold it, right, and to see the other person for who they really are. Some of the traits, you know, of toxic relationships would be someone who is obviously physically abusive, but also mentally, right? We think about abuse, we hear these terms a lot, so we could break down what that is. But again, I, I want to um, continue to look at how we, we do recognize it in the other person, but it's not really about the other person ultimately, right? And it's a very nuanced conversation because, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, it's really something that needs to be healed within. But if I'm in a relationship and someone's physically abusing me, I also need to leave the relationship. But then there's more healing that is required. So again, it's really any relationship that is causing harm to ourselves. And there are many layers to that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so talk to me a little bit more about why it's important for us to focus on ourselves as opposed to others. Like you said, you have a toxic relationship. Yes, some of it is about the other person, like if they're physically or mentally or emotionally abusive. But how is it more about you? Well, you know, my own story, the reason I always start with my own story about remembering being open and loving and present, and then that experience changed. In my experience in working with people for decades now, and certainly in my own journey, as well as people in my life who are my friends, it seems that many of us, if not all of us, are carrying around what I call core false beliefs. Uh, the reason I call them core false beliefs instead of core beliefs is that I want to acknowledge their lies that we've picked up about ourselves. Usually these things come really early. And so if we are walking around, for example, with a core false belief that we're unlovable, we're going to be holding that not only as a thought, but it really is a frequency. And so that was one for me. And in my early 20s, I could walk into a room and I could find the one person unconsciously to support the core false belief that I was unlovable. So, you know, I was in therapy, I was learning how to communicate, I was looking at the patterns in my life, and I was desperately trying to change the pattern of why I kept choosing unavailable people. I, I, I mean, at the time I would have said I was attracting unavailable people, but we are literally vibrating at a particular frequency. And no matter how much work we do in the outer realm, unless we've healed those deep core false beliefs, we'll continue to unconsciously choose relationships over and over again to support the core false belief. Can you give a few other examples so that um, if somebody's in a relationship or somebody's dealing with these different belief systems, what are what are some other belief systems that might be causing similar problems? Well, usually they start with I am or I am not. And some of the most popular that I hear is I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. Um, the, the I'm not worthy one seems to be really, really prevalent in our culture. And so a lot of times the solution to these core false beliefs is to try to quote unquote fix them from the outside in. So let's say, for example, I have a belief that I'm not worthy. I might not even be aware that I have that belief, but I can see myself continuing to have the same situations replicate over and over and over again in my life then I can start to ask, I wonder what the core false belief might be. Usually we have strategies to manage the core false belief that are op often the opposite. So for example, if someone has a core false belief they're not worthy, maybe the way they manage that or work with that is to get one more degree, get the perfect job, work 12 hours a day, right? They be, may become high achievers because they're really... Um, desperately trying to heal or to, in some ways, um, even pretend like it's not there, right? No, that's not true. And I'll show you why it's not true. Uh, and so, of course, we can talk more about how that can be effective, but it also can be limiting to only try to, uh, quote unquote, fix it from the outside in. So it's almost like they're trying to prove themselves wrong. 
Right, exactly. Right, whichever right. way. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I mean, on a conscious level, we're trying to prove ourselves wrong. But on this deeper subconscious level, we're ultimately going to prove ourselves right. Right. right? No, no matter yeah. how much work we do, ultimately, like, see, it is true. I am. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. It's just what I told you. Yeah. Um, how would somebody find out what their false core beliefs are? Um, I, I know you, you had the questions, but is there like some kind of activity they could do? Is there some type of um, interaction they could have with maybe a therapist that would help them identify these? Well, we want to look at the patterns that that repeat themselves, right? And if we see something that keeps happening in our lives, so if I hear myself saying something like, why does this keep happening to me? No matter how hard I try, I always end up in this place, right? When we have that information from the outside, then we can start to ask the question, I wonder if there is a core false belief that might be contributing to that. And if I'm not aware of it, then we can start to explore when I feel, I guess, the most pain in these situations, because usually what happens is this, we get in a relationship and we say, this time it's going to be different. This person seems so available and so open and so loving. Then we get past the honeymoon period and then we realize, wow, this feels the same as before. So the times when it's the most painful, we want to ask ourselves, what is the experience of that? does this repeat in my life? And in what way might a core false belief be contributing to it? And if the answer to that is there is some way that it's contributing, what might that core false belief be? So it really is just an, an exploration using open-ended questions to try to get in touch with what that might be. So let's say they find that false core belief or a list of them. Maybe they have five or six of them. How do they go about correcting them or changing well, this, them? This is the million dollar question, right? So after I answer this, someone can Venmo me. I don't know if you can Venmo a million dollars, <laughs> I doubt it, but you can send me I, I, so, in I some way so. you can wire me the million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the million dollar question because I think what we hear most often is change the narrative. Um, and I remember thinking when I first got in touch with these core false beliefs, to tell you the truth, it was more painful than when I wasn't in touch with them. Because when I wasn't in touch with them, it was just the other person's fault. And even though that was painful, there was something about it that was, um, I didn't have to be responsible. So I'm like, oh, this person's not available. This, this, my boss didn't see me. This job was a dead end job, right? So there was something about that that was almost easier. Once I got in touch with the core false beliefs, and by the way, I'm not suggesting others do this. I'm just saying this is what I did. I went from blaming others to blaming myself. And I stayed in that blame frequency, if you will. And I felt even more stuck. Then I came across, you know, the idea that just changed the narrative. And I thought, well, yeah, but how? So when we get to the how, we can ask the questions. This to me is the deeper work. It's not just change the narrative or as some of the models say, opposite action, just act like you're successful and eventually you'll catch up with that. And there is there is some validity to that. And I think in some ways it works. The deeper work here is to look at when it or originated. Usually it's quite young. When it originated, our, our brains weren't even developed to understand what we were doing. So we concretize these in our, in our subconscious and when we become aware of where they originated, we can start to heal them as the six-year-old, as the seven-year-old, as the eight-year-old. I can elaborate on that, but the short answer is we don't just talk ourselves out of them. Yeah, I, I find that interesting. Um, when my when my kids were little, and you can tell me if this was something that I did right or not right, I'd be curious on what your thoughts are. But when they were ever since they were really little and they started school. Um, when they would make, um, a bad decision or when they would have, maybe, maybe they failed a test, for example. Um, my philosophy was we celebrated it because mm -hmm. I think you learn more from your mistakes than you ever learn from your successes. Not that we didn't celebrate the successes. We did that too, but we celebrated these milestone errors <laughs> by going out to dinner and talking about what did you learn from the situation? 
And I think because of that, my kids are really good at problem solving and they hold themselves accountable, but not blame themselves. They don't blame others. It's like, okay, this interaction did not go well. So how can I change the way I interacted to maybe get a different result next time? Wow. And so my question would be for you, and you already kind of answered it. How did that work? Right. Because I, I think it's so well, I think it worked well. Well, then that's that's that that's the answer, right? I mean, that, my daughter just turned 25 and she graduated medical school and she's in a very highly sought after residency program. My other daughter's 22 getting ready to do something else that's really big. And she doesn't like it when I talk about her. So <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about one all the doll- all that I want. The other one does wants her life to be private. So Perfect. But I, I think it worked out rather well, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Well, I think anytime we take the shame out of it, it's a victory, right? Um, I and, and I also want to say, sometimes we think that it's either right or wrong. And I like to ask the question, what gets created when I do it, rather than is it right or wrong? So because, you know, I mean, I think back, you know, I'm obviously a lot older than you are. So I grew up in the era when my parents, like my mom, when they were reading the books on childcare, it was like, you know, let them cry it out in the bed. Um, don't hug them too much. I mean, it was crazy what they thought was the right yeah. way to to parent. Um, and now we have the right way to parent as something else. So I think if we can take the right, wrong, good, bad out of it and just ask the question, what gets created when I do this? Um, you know, life is an experiment. And and you know, I hate to say parenting right. is an experiment, but it is. I Let's just so. name it, right? We try Every to parent has works. an experiment going on at their house. You know, how are your kids going to turn out? <laughs> Here are the variables. <laughs> well, and I think any time that we acknowledge what's happening and, and allow someone to be present with it and talk about what they're experiencing, that's the victory, right? Because um, you know, when we go into the, it's bad, you know, I, in, in my third book, I write about, I, I, I use a character, her name is Sasha, and she's one that was very high achieving, right? She's an attorney, she was trying to get partner in her firm. And her childhood, she was a straight A student. But if she were ever to bring anything home other than an A, her parents would ignore her, right? And so she immediately believed wow. And even if they didn't ignore her, that's what her story about it was, right? Which is right. much more important than what happened. Well, she, that's what I was thinking. Her perception is you don't fail because you'll be ignored. Right, exactly. So you would think, well, that's great. So then you're just going to always succeed. But the shadow side to that is I'm only worthy if I am perfect, right? Exactly. So, so to be to be able to, regardless if we call it a victory or good, bad, right, wrong, if we're allowing ourselves or our children to talk about what happened, so let's talk about this experience. What did that feel like? What are your thoughts about it? What are you noticing in your body? I mean, that really is what we want to be able to do because for most of us, and certainly true in my story, it was go to, go to your room so you can stop crying. If you're going to keep crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Let's just say there wasn't a lot of emotional intelligence in my household. <laughs> yeah, and I think we've learned since then that you know you can't really do that to a small child. It's it it it, it hurt. It's hurtful to them. Yeah, and you you know if you've had that type of parenting, you know firsthand that it's hurtful. Yeah, and and when we look at even through the lens of brain development. A young child, and I don't know all the different stages, but the the really young child, or like maybe like four to eight, I think it is, they're very concrete, right? So it's either this or it's that. It's good or it's bad. So yeah. if one if a parent is upset, I must be bad. Even if the parent doesn't say you're right. a bad girl or you're a bad boy, you know, that that we get those messages. That concrete thinking is yeah, is this how little kids think. Exactly. You know, it's funny because abstract thinking doesn't really kick in until about the age of eight or so. Right. Roughly. And so it's not really until they're in school, second, third grade, when they really start understanding that there's a whole lot of gray area between what's right and what's wrong. And I think you're right in that if they have those images of I'm only worthy if I am always excelling um, and that's the only time I get attention, then even though they understand the gray area in between, you're right. They have that false belief. So they're still going to strive to constantly get that, that aid. Cause that's the only way they're going to get attention. 
That's right. Because what happens is as we grow up, we start to understand the nuance of it, right? But when we were really little, we didn't. And so it happens at a very deeply unconscious level. And so we don't just talk ourselves out of it because I can look back at my five-year-old, for example, and I, I have this one event where I remember deciding I was stupid. I can understand now intellectually, well, of course you weren't stupid for that, but the five-year-old didn't understand that. No. So the deeper work isn't blame the teacher, right? Because I, it's funny because sometimes, you know, I've posted this story online and some people go into like how horrible teachers are. And I'm like, that's not the point to the story, no. <laughs> right? The point of the story is when I was five, I made this massive decision on very limited information. And as an adult, I can understand the nuance of it but I can't really talk myself out of it. I have to go back to the five-year-old and in some way through self-parenting, through reparenting, allow myself to feel because when I decided I was stupid, the truth is I felt really afraid. I felt really less than. I had all this, all these emotions that were present that I buried very deeply. And so excavating those is a big part of the healing process. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um... So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, we'll, we'll, when we go to break, uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about all your different books. But um, let's talk a little bit about how somebody can get in touch with you and um, how they can purchase your books. And if there's any um, special offers that you'd like to offer. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, the best I think the best place to find me is on Instagram, TJ Woodward underscore. And then, you know, there on the profile, you'll see the link to everything I'm up to, courses, books, speaking events. Um, I will offer a, a gift if I can. Is it okay to give a URL as a gift? Sure. So, so go to tjwoodwardfreegift.com. Um, I just offer their three different uh, free video courses that are based on my three books. So okay. I'm delighted and to offer that today to your listeners. tjwoodwardfreegift.com. Freegift.com. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And let's talk, um, let's just give everybody the name of your books. It's Conscious Recovery, Conscious Being, and Conscious Creation. And where can they purchase copies of the book? If you go to my website, tjwoodward.com, that's the best place. It's going to direct you to Amazon, but, if, you know, going there is probably the best place. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure we got that out before we went to break. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Um, you know, some examples of people that you've worked with, how have some of your clients made these grand uh, transitions from having these really difficult beliefs to deal with? And how are they doing now? Well, I've, I've witnessed a lot of healing and I've witnessed it through not this one, you know, I think the mind, I, I'm just thinking of this one client who <laughs> ultimately she just couldn't work with me anymore because I just kept wanting her to feel. And she was like, I want the three steps. You are supposed to give me the three steps so I can become more successful. And I said, well, I am giving you the three steps, awareness, awareness, and awareness. And she's like, I don't think you're the right person to work with. <laughs> And what, because the reason I say this is it, 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 um, I think sometimes we want it to be here that if once I do these three things, then suddenly I'll be on the other side of it. And to me, healing is actually much more of a process and it's learning how to be present with ourselves. And so I've seen great success in the people I've worked with, but it's not always instantaneous. It takes a little bit of time often, but then we can have these spontaneous insights where we realize that we're not our past, we're not our traumas. We do have the ability to reconnect with our true nature. And we actually can unlearn uh, some of these core false beliefs we've been carrying around. It, yeah, I, I like that you said it was a process because I think for for everyone that I've ever met, for myself included, everything in life seems to be a process. You, you, you kind of become aware of certain things and you think you're doing great. You think you got it all figured out and life is fantastic. And then maybe you meet somebody who, who sparks something in your, in your mind, or uh, you read a book or something happens and you're like, oh, maybe I'm not completely where I need to be. So I still, you know, need to move a little bit further uh, down the line on the, on this thought process. And, and 
you know, maybe you stay there again for another six months or a year before you move to the next level and the next level. And, and it might take you five, 10 years to get to where you really need to be. And I think that journey is really important to recognize. Yeah. And I also, for me, I don't want there to, I don't want there to be a finish line. I used to want to be like, I'm going to be completely better. And, you know, in my, I, I think about my 20 year old self and, and I think what I expected using the term awakened, let's say, or using the term evolved or using the term healed, whatever word we used, I thought that meant that I would no longer have any problems. And I looked at people that I respected and thought they just must not have any problems anymore. And I realize now that's not the journey. It's I have a different awareness of how I relate to myself. The pain, um, you know, the trauma doesn't necessarily go away, but it no longer has a, a grip on me. It no longer is what's running my life. I have the ability now to live in a very different way. Life continues to happen, but I have a new way of seeing. I have a new way of being, a new way of relating to it. And so I don't want there to be a finish line because like you say, I want one more book that just expands my consciousness, one more awareness, one more moment where I think, oh, wow, there's a deeper level of, of openness that I can achieve here. So, you know, what, what once was I'm, I'm in a race and I want there to be a finish line. Now it's real. It re truly is about the journey. I, I love it. Yeah, I, I truly agree with you on that. Um, so we will be um, taking a break here just a minute. So if you are interested in getting in touch with me, you can go to executivefunctioncoachaz.com and make sure you subscribe to our magazine, Executive Function Magazine. We just launched our June issue. It is a fabulous issue. So if you'd like to see it, you can go onto the website, take a look at that. Um, if you'd like to see TJ's uh, video of this interview, you can go onto our YouTube channel. Um, we should have the video on probably by the end of this week. And once again, if you'd like uh, to get his free gift, go to TJ Woodwork, Woodward, TJ Woodward free I was a little tongue tied there. Sorry. About that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and and just so that everybody knows, uh, without you, this would not be possible. We really appreciate our listeners and we are moving uh, we are leaving Voice America at the end of this month. So if you'd like to continue to follow us, make sure you check out um, our website. Through our website, you can um, follow everything, uh, including our social media and our YouTube channel. And we'll be back after these messages. Okay, great job. We're all clear. Back in about two. Okay, thanks, ma'am. Great. <laughs> Perfect. How do you think it's going? I think it's going fabulous. How Perfect. about you? Just any, any, you know, any direction you want to take me, I'm willing to go. Okay. So um, I'm just curious, have you ever tried hypnotherapy? I have not. Well, if you're ever interested, I actually get a lot of success with trauma, yeah. with regression therapy. Um, I go back in your memories to childhood and we basically just take the uh, intensity out of the emotion. If right. you're ever interested in trying it, I'd be happy to do a session for you for free. Oh my um, gosh, thank I get you. A, yeah, I get a lot of success with that. I work with a lot of uh, trauma, um, PTSD, you know, a lot of different trauma, and I get a lot of um, individuals with anxiety. So if you're ever interested, um, you have my number. You can feel free to call me. I'd be happy to do it for you. And we oh, can do it remotely. You. I love it. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, when we come back, um, I will briefly reintroduce you and we'll talk about your books and what, you know, process that it took you to write the books. And I'd like uh, to talk a little bit more about um, your, your clients and those examples, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Thank you. No, this has been absolutely wonderful. You were just so easy to talk to. Yay. Thank you. You are too. Thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> it's a process you know it is I used to have a, a tv show um where, and I interviewed people and we were live so it was live 30 minutes and it was such a great um you know sort of training for me it was on the job training for sure but I we did a hundred episodes so I I nice. um, and you know live in the studio and I was running the cameras too it was very low budget oh, wow. <laughs> so no producer in the room I'm like camera one camera two <laughs> But it was fun. It was, you know, the art of interviewing someone and being really present while also holding everything that you have to be aware of. Um, but it was, it, I loved it. 
Yeah. You know, I, I really do enjoy doing the live shows. It's just, I mean, there, there's something different about a live show. You, you, you're really on top of your game. You're paying attention to what you're doing. I've noticed when I've done recordings, people are like, oh, can we, can we just stop? And, and, right, right. and I was like, no, no, I really would rather not. I'd rather we just talk through the whole thing and, and then I can go back and edit if I need to, but exactly. Yeah. But it's a lot of fun. I, I love just meeting different people. It's a lot of fun for me. Yeah. All right. 20 seconds. Thank you, Matt. I'll miss working with Matt. Yeah. He's awesome. It's your world. Motivate, change, <laughs> succeed. VoiceAmericaEmpowerment.com. <laughs> You are listening to Focus on Success. To reach Fazia Costi or her guest on the live show, please call 1 888 346 9141. That's 1 888 346 9141. You may also send an email to Fazia at Executive Function Coach AZ.com. Now, back to Focus on Success. Hi, welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. We are talking with TJ Woodward. He is a revolutionary recovery expert, and we're going to talk about his books next, Conscious Recovery, Conscious Being, and Conscious Creation. So welcome back to the show, TJ. Thank you. I loved the first half of our show, so I know this is going to be fun as well. <laughs> well, I really enjoyed talking to you. You know, some guests are so much easier to talk to than others. So thank you for being so easy to talk to. Um, let's talk about your books. You've got three fabulous books. When did you write these books? Let's see. Conscious Being came out in 2015. Conscious Recovery came out in 2017. My intention for Conscious Creation was to do to come out in 2019 because I had that two year idea, but it definitely was a slower process. And then, you know, 2020, some things happened in the world that caused me to like kind of shift a little. So it came out in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you weren't alone in that. I think it kind of threw Somehow. everything. Off. <laughs> that was a uh, that was an awkward year. I think everyone felt they were in the twilight zone. I've heard that so much. Everyone's like, I think we're in the twilight zone. I don't know. I lived, I lived in San Francisco, and my husband and I took a walk that first Saturday night, and we walked through the Castro. Not a single human was in on the street. And I thought never in my lifetime did I think I would see that because I had oh, at that point lived in San Francisco yeah. for like over 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I did not close my office down. I went into the office that week and um, I was the only one in the whole building. And I live and I worked in a very big, big building, like on 24th Street Camelback in Phoenix, which is a yeah. very bustling, busy area of town. So I yeah, it was it was a, a unique experience. It sure but, was. So um, you've got these fabulous books, um, and I know that you have uh, accompanying workbooks to go with them. Let's let's talk about them. Is there a specific order in which someone should be reading these books? You know, that question gets asked, and I don't have the answer. Um, what I will say is I'm not sure that the, the order they were released in is the order I would read them in. Uh, it depends on a person's life journey, right? So conscious recovery I think is the book that has the most success, I would say, because treatment programs throughout the country and soon to be throughout the world use the book and use my curriculum that I've developed, also the workbook. So in, in some ways, Conscious Recovery is the book that I'm the most known for. Um, and so if someone is either struggling with an addiction or they're in recovery, uh, I would say Conscious Recovery would be the place to start. Or maybe if you have a loved one who has some kind of an addiction, um, we can talk more about what I mean by addiction because it's such a, you know, that term can be such a broad umbrella. But if you're not someone who um, has an addiction issue or is in recovery, I might start with Conscious Creation because Conscious Creation is a book that really allow it's five steps to embracing the life of your dreams is the tagline. And I really created it out of my years of experience of working with people who really want to manifest, right? Because we hear that so much in our culture. I think if we don't hear, you know, removing toxicity, the other one we hear a lot now is manifesting. So if you do want to 
cre consciously create your life that's much more than just how do I use affirmations to manifest stuff? Uh, conscious uh, creation might be the book for you. Conscious being might be the third one to read, interestingly enough, even though it was the first one I wrote. So talk to me a little bit about what that's about. Conscious being? Correct. Conscious being is about understanding that we create our life based on our level of consciousness. And if that sounds esoteric, I can say it in a much simpler way. We create the meaning of our life. We create the purpose of our life. We talked about that at the beginning of the show. Yes. So to be able to understand that we can shift the way we're viewing the world and therefore the way we experience the world, I think that's kind of the focus of that book. And it's how to shift the awareness, how to understand that we are the creator of our life. Of course, Conscious Creation addresses that one as well. Very nice. So you've written these three books. Your conscious recovery is used in treatment centers. The other two are more self-help. Would yes. you say yeah. that? Okay. Um, how how does um how does that work? Like if they were going to read conscious being and conscious creation, would you recommend that they do the workbook that accompanies it as they're reading it? Or would you recommend they do the workbook after? Or do they even need the workbook? Well, the workbook came, the workbooks came to be when I was having a conversation with my good friend, Dr. Adriana Popescu. And we were talking about like the, the book that at the time it was conscious being like conscious being has all this great content, but how does one actually apply it to their life? And so she and I started a conversation of co-creating work, a workbook to accompany that book so that people could understand okay, these are, these are these concepts, but how do I actually apply it? And so the workbooks are more practical. I highly recommend the workbooks because I, for me, when I read a book, like for example, my one of my favorite books is A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. I read that and there's these incredible concepts. And then I ask myself, so how does this apply to my life? And what are some, some exercises maybe that I can do to actually make this a little more practical? So I would say, to me, what I what I would recommend is maybe read the book through. If it's something that calls to you or speaks to you, that is something that could help you in your life, then I would recommend getting the workbook and, and starting to work through it. And you can read a chapter and do the exercises in the chapter. That certainly works. Yeah, I like that. I like reading through the book and then going back and, you know, doing it a second time through with the workbook. I think mm -hmm. that sounds like a really um, nice way to work through some of the the challenges. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about addiction. What what is your definition of addiction? Well, when we think of addiction and when I tell people I work a lot in the addiction treatment field, inevitably it it seems like I would say like eight people out of 10 say yeah, the homelessness issue is really terrible. And so somewhere in our consciousness we believe that addiction equals homelessness and obviously that is one face of addiction. We see it on the streets, right? If you live in a big city, you see it, it's it's in your right. face. But that is certainly not the whole story of addiction. So the broad umbrella I use is, if I'm using anything, a, a person, food, sex, shopping, drugs and alcohol, to try to fix something that feels broken within, and I'm doing that repetitively, we could see that as an addiction. Uh, you know, one thing I like to say is if it if it's working, we don't call it addiction, we call it fun. It's only when it starts to cause issues in our lives that we say, oh, maybe this is an addiction, right? And so in conscious recovery, we talk about core false beliefs, which we talked about a lot in the first part of the show. Then we look at brilliant strategies and the brilliant strategies are to try to manage the core false beliefs. And often a brilliant strategy will be an, addic an addiction. Uh, I think we tend to think of addiction as bad or wrong, but I like to say, let's look at it as brilliant because there's a reason you started using it. For example, in my life, drugs and alcohol saved my life. You know, I did have these big decisions that I was broken. When I discovered weed and alcohol at 13 or 14, it literally saved my life. I got sober young at 20, 20 years old, so 37 years ago, but that was just the beginning of the journey because the drugs and alcohol were causing problems in my life, but they weren't actually the problem. It was something much deeper. 
So how did it actually save your life though? Like people. Yeah, you know. like that sounds a little provocative, doesn't it? <laughs> I think um, if I look at the escape that it gave me um, and through very difficult years, um, I did believe I was broken. This did help me to feel um, at ease again. I don't know if something could have happened. Maybe I wouldn't even be alive because I actually found myself suicidal when I was in early recovery. And so without drugs and alcohol, I don't know what that okay. would have looked like. Um, also from a mental health perspective, I think you know there would have been something Something could have happened to me, um, either from a mental health perspective or even, you know, suicide that drugs and alcohol prevented. So it kept you more sedate and kind of kept you from reacting in a more drastic way, maybe? I think so. And, and you know, that's not to say that those that they were the the healthiest or the best answer, but it got me through those years. And then I was able to say, okay maybe they're no longer really actually brilliant. Maybe now it's time to put those down and to do some of the deeper work. I think you're right. Maybe you weren't ready to do the deep work. Maybe you weren't emotionally mature enough to handle those really difficult topics. And, yeah. and I, I think that's probably what most people feel. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So if you're 16 and you're listening to this, we're, we're, we're not saying go use cocaine. It's wonderful or whatever the drug is now. What, what I'm saying in, is in my own journey, if I look back, it did save my life, but it didn't really um, provide what I was deeply longing for, which was love and connection. That's what I really wanted. And it was a false sense of that through drugs and alcohol. So it worked for a little while to help me numb out these deeper um, sort of the pain that was happening within me. So you use that until you were ready to really do the work. And, and once you were able to do the work, then you could put the drugs and alcohol aside and say, okay, I can deal with this now. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that, the way you framed it sounds so um, delicate. What really happened is it got really, really very, very painful. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like the emptiest I'd ever been. And I was trying to use more drugs to try to feel something try to feel something, you know, try to feel connected. And I, I reached a place of very deep despair uh, and then found recovery through a friend. And it really did save my life. And for the first year of my recovery, I just was grateful. I was grateful to not, you know, I, I was going to work. I was not waking, waking up. I, I was sleeping to start with, you know, all the, all the things, but then at, at around a year and a half or so, um, I did find myself suicidal because I hadn't yet addressed the, the underlying issues. And that that moment, it was almost like I was forced to. Uh, and I met a woman named Mary Helen and she changed my life and took me on a journey of rediscovering my true nature and also the ability to heal the underlying root causes. Um, in conscious recovery, I identify the three root causes of addiction as unresolved trauma, spiritual disconnection and toxic shame. Interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about each one of those? Yeah. Um, you know, trauma is something that I'm very grateful is on the forefront now. We're talking about it a lot. And there's a lot of amazing people. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk with his book, The Body Keeps the Score, Gabor Mate, who's bringing us so much great information on trauma and the relationship between trauma and addiction and trauma and mental health concerns. So using a broad definition of trauma, it really is self-defined. Right. Sometimes, you know, in my field, we tend to use the term big T, little T trauma. I'm not a fan of that because what can seem so insignificant for one person can be just this major life moment. You know, I referenced my my five year old. I couldn't tie my shoes. It was something so simple. And I can remember like it was yesterday. I can still see the floor. I was sitting in the back of the classroom. I can see the metal desks. I can see the floor. And I remember the feeling of everyone knows how to do this, but me, I must be stupid. And mm. so for someone to say, oh my gosh, that's so traumatic. Um, someone would probably think that was the most insignificant moment. They just learned to tie their shoes and went on. But for me, there was something about that. And so trauma is anything that I think is counter to um, us as a whole and perfect being. Um, and it comes in many different forms. 
I agree. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And then the other two items, could you share, talk a little bit more about those as well? Yeah. So spiritual disconnection, that, that one's, you know, the term spiritual is something that um, a lot of people have a lot of ideas of what that means. And so for me, it means something really simple. And that is definitely, it came out of my own story, this idea that we come into the world as whole and perfect spiritual beings, and then we get programmed. So the pre-programmed human is loving, open. You know, if you look at a very small child, they feel their feelings. They want to love and connect. They, they will stare at you. They're very present. Uh, and then we get taught all these things that are counter to that. So we disconnect from our true nature and we start to connect to these stories about ourselves. And then we start to look to the world to try to heal it. So we walk around with our umbilical cord in our hand, trying to get fed by a person, a place, situation, you know, drugs, alcohol, all the things that we mentioned. But ultimately, um, the truth of who we are is always available to us. So we reconnect with that as part of our recovery or our evolution. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. And then the third one? Third one is toxic shame. Uh, and shame, very simply, is a belief in our own brokenness. Um, of course, we've heard now the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I believe I've done something wrong. Shame is, I believe I'm fundamentally wrong or there's something wrong with me. Really, we've been talking about shame the entire time without using the word when we look yeah. at these four false beliefs about ourselves. Yeah, I, I think um, I think for a lot of people, that's debilitating. Absolutely. And that becomes that frequency that we talked about, right? Shame is something that gets uh, healed very differently than guilt, right? So guilt is more behavioral. So if I've done something that I believe is wrong, I tried my best to fix that. If I've stolen something from someone, I pay it back. If I've hurt someone in some way, I apologize. Shame is something really different. Shame is I, I did this because I believe I'm broken. Because I believe I'm broken, I act broken in the world and there's more shame. The way we heal shame is through a safe environment to be vulnerable and authentic, to really share who we and what we are. The way to reach our true nature is by revealing all those parts of ourselves that maybe we've buried in the unconscious, whether we call it shadow work, it really is about integrating all parts of self, and it starts with the safe environment to do that. Very much so. Can you give me some examples of your clients' journeys? Their journey, like any any one of your clients who's had a very difficult start and who's had a really successful journey through this process. Yeah, in in conscious creation, one of the things I did. That's my third book. I create two characters and these two characters aren't actually completely real people. They're based on real people, but obviously I'm not going to share my client's personal information, right? So I've created these two characters that have characteristics or aspects of people I've worked with. One of them is Trevor and he's someone who was um, in the foster care system and he was sexually abused as a young child. And because of that, his mom left him when he was really young because of that, he decided he was unlovable. And so the whole journey I take him through in conscious creation is how to reconnect with his true nature, how to heal these core false beliefs. Um, he, he, you know, he was in an addiction for many, many years. You know, again, this is in, in conscious creation. Once he put down the, the drugs and alcohol, it was time for him to actually look at what needed to be healed. And I, I keep using the word healed because, um, you know, in, in my world, we use the term addiction treatment. And I actually want us to look at how we can truly heal. So I walk through two characters in conscious creation, Sasha and Trevor, and their own journey toward reconnecting with themselves. His issue in life was difficulty in relationships. And so we take him take you know the reader through the journey of how he did reconnect with himself and really understand that the going back to our theme of toxic relationships that it was about what needed to be healed within first very nice thank you for sharing that thank you do you have any do you have any other um stories you can share with us well you know i think about so many different journeys um you know when I look at, I'm going to talk a little bit about addiction and sort of what I see in the addiction treatment field. Um, 
you know, I started working in the addiction treatment field in 2008. And a couple of things that I noticed that were really striking was that people were coming back to treatment five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Uh, and we were saying to them, what are you going to do differently? And I was aware that most of the way we were treating addiction was through behavior. We were giving them tools. Um, we were helping stabilize them. We were um, help, help teach, to helping them to learn how to not drink or use. But were we actually getting down to the deeper root causes? Were we really helping someone heal the trauma, disconnection, and shame that for me are the three root causes of addiction? The other thing that was really striking is that um, clients were being viewed as their diagnosis or as broken in some way. So I could tell you countless stories of people who I worked with through simply witnessing them as having the ability to heal provided an opportunity for them to actually start their healing process. Well, I, I, I really, I'm sorry that you had such trauma in your life, but I think because of your trauma, you have such an incredible gift to share the, with the world and truly help others, you know, relieve that trauma, that disconnect, that shame so that they can create a better life for themselves. So I think that is an, an amazing um, legacy to leave behind when you're uh when your life is over, you've got three wonderful books. Are you? Do you have any other books in your horizon that you're going to write? Or? No, I, I I won't say I'm never going to write a book because as soon as I say I'm never going to write another book, then I'll be you know writing another book. There might be an autobiography at some point, but it's in the future at some point. And thank you for acknowledging that. There, there's nothing um, that is more true for me than the knowing that everything that I've gone through with my trauma is now an opportunity to help people heal. I wouldn't change a thing. And I love that these three books and these workbooks are out there because like you said, long after I'm gone, someone can pick up the book or do one of my courses and have a, an experience of their true nature. And so oh, yeah, nothing could be better than that. I think an autobiography would make it a nice, neat package. <laughs> okay, I'll start that in 2030. Okay. How's that? I, I, I need to hear about this autobiography. <laughs> 2030, I, we said it here. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. <laughs> it's a deal. Um, so last question, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Wow, I mean, when I think about my 20-year-old self, it's such an interesting age that you chose because... It's the year that my drinking was the worst and the year I got sober. So the, the, if I had advice from my 20 year old self, I would say, be gentle with yourself and you deserve love. Absolutely. Just that simple. Absolutely. Well, let's give everybody um, your information one last time so that they can go to uh, purchase your book or get your free gift. So if you don't mind sharing that information one more time, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Instagram is TJ Woodward underscore. Follow me there. You'll see whenever a new show comes out, there's also a link there in the bio to my website and all the books and courses and everything and all the different interviews I've done with some really phenomenal humans. So I'm super grateful to have had this interview with you, phenomenal human. <laughs> Why? Thank you, sir. I, um, I've really enjoyed this. So, um, yeah, so, and if you're interested in getting in touch with me, you can go to my website, executivefunctioncoachaz.com. You can register for, um, I'm sorry, you can subscribe to our magazine, Executive Function Magazine. Our next issue comes out July 10th. So if you'd like to receive that issue, um, please make sure you subscribe. And I just want to thank our listeners. Um, once again, without you, this would not be possible. So I'm very grateful for each and every one of you. And at the end of this month, I will no longer be on Voice America. So I really hope that you'll continue to follow us um, as we continue this journey um, in our podcast. And um, you can go to our website once again and follow us there. Um, once again, that website is executivefunctioncoachaz.com. And I think that's all I've got. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you all next time. All right, that's a wrap. Good job today. All clear. All right, Perfect. thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, thank thanks to both of you, and have a great rest of your day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump out of the call, Fazia. I'll talk to you next All time. All right, you take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Perfect.